Welcome to the We Are Libertarians presidential debate series. This is part of a series of 10 debates with every candidate for president formally invited to participate and provide their ideas on a variety of issues. Today, I am joined by Arvin Vora, Benjamin Letter, Christopher Marks, and Kimberly Ruff. <laughs> and they will be discussing domestic policy. Candidates, you will have one to two minutes to answer each question. At the end of your allotted time, I will simply say time, and you must quickly wrap up your thought. You can also finish and yield the remainder of your time if you've answered the question sufficiently. I will ask the question and call on you in a random order to answer. While I am a libertarian, I have designed these questions to be challenging and have modeled both the questions and the format after major presidential debates, not the friendly formats that you may be used to. My audience is tasked with evaluating the quality of your responses. I will be judging you based on how prepared you are for these challenges, how well you understand the questions that I set before you, how well you manage your time, and how compelling your answers are to make all Americans, not just libertarians, vote for you and be on board with your cause. At the end, you will be given three minutes to issue a closing statement, which you may use to summarize your feelings on domestic policy, challenge an opponent's response to a question, and or address an issue that did not get brought up during the debate. Keep in mind immigration, economy, science, energy, and education, while they are domestic policies, will be discussed in their own detailed separate debates. Candidates, here we go. You will have two minutes to answer the following. Even according to left-leaning sources like the Washington Post, up to 98% of mass shootings occur in gun-free zones, and over one dozen potential mass shootings are stopped every month by an armed citizen. However, citizens of countries like Japan and the United Kingdom, with stricter gun regulations, are 25 times less likely to be murdered by any source. With up to 80% of the American population favoring some type of gun control, how do you hope to persuade citizen, citizens that, that favor the Second Amendment and believe it will lead to less violence instead of more? Benjamin, we will start with you. I really don't know about that statistic about 80% of Americans being in favor of some type of gun control. Um, what I do know is that the right to bear arms is not only is it ingrained in, in the Constitution, but it, it is one of the most natural things uh, that a person can do. Um, it is, is a natural uh, feeling to want to be able to protect yourself. Uh, when you feel threatened, uh, it, is, it is natural uh, to grab something to protect yourself. Um, I think we've gone too far in this country with gun control. We've been pushing gun control. I've heard about gun control my entire life. Uh, I've seen gun control legislation get passed. Uh, and I've seen nothing come of it, no results, um, and it hasn't yielded any results. So I think that this is an issue we should back away from or, or rethink. Uh, the 1968 Gun Control Act, for instance, has been pretty predatory in how it strips people of its rights. People that are convicted of felonies, uh, they cannot possess a firearm or purchase a firearm. Uh, to protect themselves. Oftentimes, uh, you know, they get out of prison uh, and they find themselves defenseless in uh, rough neighborhoods. Um, and I think that that just sets up uh, more conflict. And that's why we see, uh, we see it in the news more, more and more um, every day. I think people should embrace their right to bear arms and to protect themselves uh, so that we have less victims or potential victims out there in society. Um, I think I'll yield my time there, Hody. Um, I'm pretty Great. sure I'm at two minutes. You're good. Christopher, that question goes to you. Well, you know, I think that what we need to come to understanding is that the Second Amendment is very clear, shall not be infringed. Um, add on top of that, it, 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 a, a common understanding of law, capitus demutia status. You have to actually be convicted of a felony or otherwise capital offense that involves a use of that right to even be able to infringe upon said right. 
and that's legal standing. Um, I'm a, I'm a firm proponent against any kind of infringement on people's Second Amendment rights. I don't care if you're carrying it openly or if you're carrying it concealed. Uh, you know, when you look at a, when you look at one of the high, a, the highest muni or the municipalities that has some of the highest and most strict gun control laws, you, all you have to do is look at Chicago, Illinois, and they have also got some of the highest gun uh, offenses um, with victims in regard to gun violence. I don't think that it, I think that the saying is very true. The only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And quite frankly, out of after hearing reading about the numerous Supreme Court rulings, law enforcement officers and our other public servants do not serve the people. And in that case, then we have to serve ourselves in our own protections. And I yield my time. Great. Mr. Vora, that question goes to you. The Second Amendment has a lot of side benefits. One is that it lets you hunt. One is that it lets you protect yourself from criminals. But the fundamental purpose of the Second Amendment is not to protect you from criminals, it is to protect you from government. And if you look at those countries that you mentioned that are not the United States, that have lower crime, you will see they are, all, are also more socialist than America. They have more infringements on fundamental rights than America does. Getting rid of gun laws, and that's one of my fundamental platform positions, getting rid of all gun laws, including the ban on automatic weapons, is not about making sure that somebody can defend themselves with a machine gun against a petty theft. Realistically, you can protect yourself against a petty thief with pretty much any gun. The reason that I want to legalize all weapons, including automatic weapons, is I want to make sure that the citizens are able to use force on par with the government. I think that machine guns and other weapons are there to put government in its place. And right now we have a government that is not in its place. We see this with these absurd SWAT team raids to go after minor amounts of marijuana, where the only thing that's actually achieved is the killing of the family's dogs. These are the reasons that I want to make sure that Americans are armed. I want people to think twice, three, a hundred times before they invade somebody's homes. And a well-armed citizenry, and I mean a citizenry that is armed equivalently to the government, is the best way to assure that. You're right. Gun-free school zones and gun-free zones are where shootings happen. But this is not just about preventing those shootings. Of course, I want to repeal gun-free school, school zone laws and would happily sign in such a bill. But my fundamental goal is to make sure that American citizens are just as strongly armed as the American government. That's why I will work to repeal all gun laws, either by signing a bill into law or simply by pardoning anybody who violates a gun law. Great. And Kim, you are the final answerer. <laughs> well, first of all, there isn't anything the gentlemen have said that I disagree with. You're absolutely right, all of you. Bravo. We did it. <laughs> what I wanted to actually expand on was the discussion of the statistics. You had talked about how in certain countries where they have less gun rights, they have less probability of having violent crime deaths caused by anything. But what you are neglecting to look at is a whole host of other circumstances, including economic opportunity. In political science, they have a concept called the frustration aggression hypothesis. And basically what that posits is that in a society that is stripped of opportunity, such as economic opportunity, which is caused by the free market or a tyrannical government that ends up stifling your civil liberties or your social liberties, people are more likely to become frustrated. And that frustration is going to funnel into aggression. That's where the violence comes from. Most of these crimes, particularly if you look at respect to, you know, black on black violence with, you know, the Bloods versus the Crips and the inner city gangs, a lot of that has to do with the fact that they've been completely denied opportunities. Government has put them in these little enclaves in these cages and they've robbed them of the chance to upwardly mobilize. And in so doing, without recognizing why, they aggress against their neighbors. If you ended up having less tyranny and you had greater economic opportunity because you had a free market system, you would have less probability of violent crime, period. And yes, absolutely, Arvin is spot on. The whole reason why our founding fathers had the Second Amendment in the first place is not so that we could go hunting with a musket, it was to ensure that we were stalwart defenders of liberty and that our government never ran roughshod over us. So good job, guys. <laughs> All right. A follow-up to that question, you will have one minute to answer this question. 
The reason that number is 80%, and Benjamin, you were correct to notice that uh, that seems a little bit high, is because people tend to disagree that Americans should have access to things like grenade launchers, long-range sniper rifles, nuclear missiles, and bombs. What line do you draw as president for the Second Amendment? And that will immediately go back to Miss Kimberly Ruff. Okay. <laughs> I love this one. As Mar Arvin very clearly stated, and I absolutely agree, I think that we should have access to the means of self-defense that are commensurate to whatever we vest in the state. And if you have grave discomfort with your neighbor having a nuclear weapon, which is absurd because they will destroy themselves in the process of detonating it, <laughs> then you should also have grave dis discomfort with the state having access to that. I don't know why we think somehow a group of elitist politicians are going to make better, healthier decisions than our neighbors are. And we permit them this uncontrollable amount of access to force, a monopoly on force indeed. And yet we say, but my neighbor, we're always worried about my neighbor. Well, your neighbor's probably a little more responsible because they got skin in the game. So that, I think that would be where you draw the line. Where is your discomfort? If it makes you uncomfortable to think of your neighbor having a Bradley tank, why is it okay for your government to have that? That, that would be what I'd have to say. And time. Arvin, that question goes to you. So far in history, the only organization that's ever used a nuclear weapon has been the U.S. government. And yes, the, yet the U.S. government believes that it should be the one controlling access to nuclear weapons, not just for individuals, but for all other sovereign nations. The simple fact is we need to ask this question. What amount of force would be required to prevent the government from robbing you through taxation to fund something immoral. I don't know what that exact amount of force is, and I think that amount of force is up to each person to figure out. Is it a nuke? Probably not. Is it a battleship or an aircraft carrier? I doubt it. I mean, if a private citizen wants to spend all their money to build a gigantic battleship or aircraft carrier, you know, I suppose that's their right. It's just a strange way to spend your money. However, when it comes to the actual decisions at the forefront of the debate right now, it's mostly about automatic weapons. And automatic weapons absolutely should be completely legalized and even encouraged. I would encourage people Time. to own them because they are the most relevant weapon to what you actually face from the state. And Benjamin, that question goes to you. Well, I'm personally a big proponent of, of concepts like the, the militia. I think the militia has been given a bad name. Uh, but you look at like the volunteer fire department, um, they don't have the same bad name and they're virtually the same concept. Uh, during uh, Hurricane Harvey, we saw the, the largest m militia operation that I think I've seen in my, in my lifetime. And people, the consensus there was that was a good thing. Um, automatic weapons have been around for over a hundred years. Um, they're entering into, I mean, they're antiques now. Uh, I'm concerned with other, other devices as well. Uh, for instance, uh, signal jamming equipment, uh, that we live in an era where people can just fly a drone. Time. And Christopher, that question will go to you. Yep. Uh, the Constitution says shall not be infringed. There's no exceptions. So that's, I yield my time. Okay. All right. Moving on to the next question. <clears throat> you will have two minutes to answer the following. Everyone is aware that politicians gerrymander districts to their own benefit, but attempts to solve the problem have failed. Famously, the you-know-it-when-you-see-it prosecution of the status quo failed in the courts. Lines draw by, drawn by independent commissions have seen very little improvement and make the process even more expensive than it already is. What ideas or solutions do you have to solve this problem? Kimberly Ruff, that question goes to you. <laughs> well, before I begin, I want to make something perfectly clear. This is completely out of the purview of the position I'm running for. <laughs> There's not anything I can do about it. That being said, I think that probably the best thing I could suggest would be for a community based on the allocation that's given to each state would have to decide to apportion it out and then determine. Unfortunately, with gerrymandering, it's such a, a ridiculous system that it benefits at times certain people and then it 
harms at times certain people. I don't know that there's one clear, true pathway to making it better. So, but again, like I said, this does not pertain to the position I'm running for. So it's not really something I can do much about. And I yield my time. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Christopher Marks, it is up to you. Um, I'm actually in, in, in agreement with Kim there. Um, the position at the executive office doesn't have any control over this. However, I think as a nation, especially so if, so for somebody that's coming from an IT background, I think probably the biggest problem with Jerry, it, for, that comes from gerrymandering comes from the fact that we are a representative republic. I think that within current uh, today's current technological advancements, we have the capability of allotting everybody an individual ID and allowing every individual to a to vote on something through the use of technology. And then we don't have to actually have a representative republic, and then we would be able to get rid of a lot of people from office. Um, hashtag budget cuts marks twenty twenty. <laughs> <laughs> Shameless. <laughs> I yield my time. Okay. Uh, Mr. Vora, that question goes to you. I don't entirely agree that the president can't influence a gerrymandering at all. And the reason is that if you think about what causes gerrymandering, gerrymandering is caused by the same thing that causes people trying to bribe government officials through whether donation to their campaigns or special events or whatever. And that is the fact that government has the ability to give special favors. And if a government can give special favors, then people will try to bribe government to get those special favor favors, bribe individual politicians to get those special favors, and yes, they'll try to gerrymander so that they can be the ones who can control those special favors. As president, I'm going to make it impossible for government to give any special favors. I'm going to be firing most of the federal government, maybe all of it. I'm going to be cutting income taxes to zero, either by signing a bill in the large, just pardoning people who don't pay income taxes. I'm going to be making government so small that it will not be able to give any special favors to anyone. So there would simply be no point in gerrymandering a federal district. I hope to use that as an example for the state level, at the state level, for state governments to also scale back so that even state governments and local governments cannot give any special favors to any person at all under any circumstance. So to me, the solution to gerrymandering is not whether, whether it's an independent commission controlled by the Democrats or Republicans or a state legislature controlled by the, by the Democrats and Republicans. It's making government so small that it cannot possibly give a single person special privileges so that no one will try to get those special privileges. Okay, and we will end with uh, Mr. Letter. Um, I don't know if there's a, a magic answer for gerrymandering, um, but as libertarian candidates, uh, I think that uh, we can get around that uh, to some extent by focusing uh, on very local campaigns. Um, it's not very often that uh, a city gets moved around too much. Sometimes it does. Uh, counties are pretty stable uh, in their lines. Um, they're not necessarily getting redistricted every time the census comes out. Uh, and by developing a, a strong presence uh, in all of the local offices across the, the country, I think that we can make a substantial difference in the, uh, the quality of life that we uh, experience on a, on a daily basis. Um, you know, I, Arvin had, has been speaking lately about uh, 50 different experiments. And, uh, you know, I like that. And, you know, there's we've also had the conversation about, you know, there's like 5,000 different counties. Uh, there's 5,000 different other experiments that can be happening there. Uh, and by people participating in their local government uh, and working towards that change that they want, um, I think that we will all uh, become a little bit more uh, satisfied with the, the status quo of uh, life in today's society. Okay. Fantastic. Let's move on. We're going to talk about the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act history has shown government surveillance has gotten out of control, will, and can be abused. Yet over 13 terror plots were foiled in the UK by surveillance in 2017 alone, with France reporting similar results. Car, cars and lots that are being recorded are far less likely to get broken into. Most Americans express agreement with the phrase, if you have nothing to hide, why are you worried? 
What stands will you take on surveillance and how you will explain this position in a way that makes the American people feel safe? Mr. Letter, that question goes to you. I, I don't know about everyone else, but I, I don't feel safer because of all this surveillance. Uh, I talk about it all the time uh, with the people I grew up with about how our generation was like the last generation that could walk around at night and expect not to be on a night vision camera somewhere. Um, we're just now experiencing what it's like to live in this modern surveillance society. And I don't think uh, the full ramifications have, have truly set in. Uh, a camera can be used to frame somebody just, just as, as quickly as it can be used to exonerate somebody. Um, I'm very uncomfortable with the <clears throat> overzealous uh, moves and grabs at, at surveillance that we've seen in the Patriot Act uh, and you know in other places in not just the United States government but governments around the world. Um, I don't know if there's a magical way to stop everybody from spying on everybody, but. I certainly don't want to enable it via legislation. And if there's if there's ways of un, unwinding what we've already uh, opened uh, up and unleashed on society, I, I would love to uh, to unwind that or repeal that. Okay, uh, Miss Kim Ruff, that question goes to you. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so I don't know if you guys ever read the 9-11 Commission report, but basically what the conclusions that were drawn from that report were essentially that of these 16 disparate and loosely confederated intelligence agencies that we have vested under the Department of Defense, State, and Treasury, there's no cross-communication. So even though they were collect collecting all this data, they weren't cross-sharing and they weren't analyzing it properly, and so they basically were asleep at the switch. So what was our solution after the 9-11 Commission report? Ours was to have the CDI, Director of Central Intelligence, or DCI, I guess, and then to basically vest more authority and more control in our intelligence community to collect data. So they have all these metadata that they're collecting on everyone, but they don't currently have the technological means or capabilities of analyzing it. But should they come to a point where they're able to sift through all this data, then they can start to build profiles. And these profiles will allow them to make predeterminations about who is committing criminal acts. It won't be as simple as I bought a pressure cooker and a backpack on Amazon and next thing I know the FBI is knocking on my door thinking I'm making a bomb. It's going to be something like Minority Report. And I'm not saying that to be a paranoid person. This is the reality. We are coming into a society that is becoming more technologically advanced and all those things are going to ultimately come to bear if we vest such authority in our government. So rather than getting into a situation where, I mean, we already have a situation where we've lost mens rea, which is in, in the system of justice, mens rea is the intention to commit a crime. So with the suspension of that, now we have a situation where we're saying effectively, well, not only have you, you don't have to prove that you committed a crime. You don't necessarily have to have the intention. You could have all this metadata that points to the desire to commit a crime and therefore be punished. I don't think we should have surveillance to the extent that we do. In fact, I don't think we should have it at all. And the only reason why we do have it is because we've been responsible in trifling in events in the Middle East Time. in other countries, and we've ne it's necessitated us trying to keep a watchful eye for making these mistakes. All right. Mr. Marks, that question is for you. You know, um, I, it, I've spoken about this a number of times. One of the, one of the things that I want to actually do during my time period as the president is go through every one of the executive orders and, and weed out all of the unconstitutional acts um, and then close down all of the deep state agencies that are operating, NSA, CIA, or, couple of, or to name a few. Um, you know, this is a throwback to something that I actually was keeping a watchful eye on in regard to PRISM that the NSA was operating, where they were actually collecting all of the metadata, all of your phone communication, stuff along those lines. And yeah, we are leading to a point in time when it is going to be a very minority report society if we continue down this path. Um, 
you know, when Kim was speaking about the loss of mens rea or the suspension of mens rea, um, that is actually the suspension is suspension of a part of due process called substantive due process, which is a requirement of this state to actually have evidence and proof of this that there was a crime committed before they actually take prosecutorial action. Um, and this is this is a reflection on what we just uh, a few months back heard from Donald J. Trump himself, where he said, we'll take the guns and deal with due process. Second, he violated the Constitution twice within less than 30 seconds. Um, we cannot allow those things to stand. We need to actually make, the, make sure that we restore our republic to a constitutional form. Um, that's where I yield my time. Great. Arvin, we'll finish with you. I've made it pretty clear that I oppose the surveillance state. I fundamentally believe in the Fourth Amendment, which says that if you want to surveil a person, there has to be something specific about that person, some probable cause about that person. It can't just be that they walked into an airport. It can't be just that they exist. It has to be something specific. So on my first day in office, I'm going to pardon, office, I'm going to pardon Edward Snowden. And from there, I'm going to work to dismantle the surveillance state. Start off by getting rid of the Patriot Act one way or another. But I want to indicate the extent to which this kind of lawlessness has pervaded our culture. Because even among libertarian presidential and vice presidential candidates in the past, we saw support for a lack of due process. When I was vice chair in 2016, Governor Bill Weld went on national TV and supported the idea of taking away somebody's Second Amendment rights if they happen to be on a terrorist watch list. Now, there's no due process in getting on that list, so it basically amounted to getting on, having your Second Amendment rights taken away without any kind of a trial, without any kind of due process. That kind of culture has pervaded that deeply. It's pervaded into the libertarian movement, even to the very top of the libertarian movement. And 2016, when I was asked if I agreed, I said, no, that's not what libertarians believe, and I, and I put forth the libertarian position. My position hasn't changed. I'm going to end the surveillance state. I'm going to downsize the 17 redundant spy agencies into one or zero. I'm going to lay most of those people off. I'm going to end that kind of warrantless wiretapping that's enabled by the Patriot Act. And what we've seen with the Patriot Act so far is that for everything even vaguely related to possibly connecting to terrorism, it is used 100 times as often for something like drugs or prostitution. This is simply an excuse, terrorism is the excuse that they're using to violate our, our, our dignity and privacy in all areas of life, and I will end it. Time. Okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Candidates, you will have two minutes to answer the following. The drug war is growing in unpopularity, with 57% of Americans stating they favor legalizing most, if not all, drugs and reducing sentences for those jailed over these laws. While states like Colorado legalized marijuana and it predictably increased revenue, the attorney general and the head of police forces also wrote reports to states that, had not, that were considering such legislation, warning them that it also increased violent crime, traffic accidents, dropout rates, and medical emergencies. Do you feel the need to put anything in place so that people who don't use recreational drugs aren't paying for the medical issues? violence, and educational failures of those who do decide to use them. We'll start with you, Benjamin. Um, drug addiction is a, is a, is a, is a complex uh, subject and has been for probably since the dawn of time. Um, it's not something that's going to go away. Um, the, the drug war uh, hasn't cured uh, the United States of drug addiction. Uh, we, we hear about uh, the opioid crisis uh, in the news all the time now. Um, you know, the question on, you know, how to deal with it and how to, how to pay for it. I don't, I don't know if this is something that requires uh, uh, direct funding through taxes. Uh, I think there's plenty of uh, private uh, companies out there that uh, offer uh, chemical dependency counseling and that if we just allow that market to flourish, that 
it will be there and that when people need counseling, uh, they can seek the counseling at, at one of these facilities or through one of these counselors and work out some type of payment arrangement uh, through them. Uh, I think that's probably the best way to, you know, to, to deal with the problem that's not just going to go away. Okay. Uh, Chris, that question is for you next. You know, Bayer Pharmaceuticals used to subscribe, used to push heroin. Uh, when heroin got scheduled as a is scheduled as a drug, it modified the chemical composition just slightly and created oxycotton. Both of these are an opioid. Now we have an opioid epidemic. Children across this nation are diagnosed with ADHD. There's prescribed uh, um, God, I can't remember it right now, but essentially it is the same chemical composition as crystal meth. Um, our next epidemic is going to be a meth epidemic. These pharmaceutical industries, by pushing these drugs and, and giving out bonuses to pharmace pharmace pharmacy practitioners, are creating an epidemic. And if there's an, and this is not a criminal action, it's already been widely understood, scientifically evaluated that this is a mental health care issue. And if these pharmaceutical industries are going to be creating these epidemics across our nation, I don't see the why we shouldn't utilize some of our, a, some of the taxes imposed on pharmaceutical industries through the Commerce Clause to actually pay to help people remedy it. We also have another issue. I've checked the Constitution, and there is no limited privilege for the government to regulate a plant. Marijuana needs to be not legalized. It needs to be deregulated. You can grow it. You can utilize it however you wish. And there is no room for this state to ever be involved in, in criminally punishing somebody for what is deemed to be a mental health care issue. That's my position. I yield my time. Kim, you're up. Okay. You asked whether, basically to summarize what you had asked and just to make sure I understood you correctly. You were saying, how can we mitigate the burdens that society faces as a result of drug addiction, correct? Yes. Would you put anything in place to deal with those, with, with the, the medical issues, violence, educational failures that happen among states that have legalized marijuana? Okay, and, other, thank you. and other drugs, yeah. All right, thanks. Um, no, I would not put anything in place. In fact, I would take things out of place. Um, the issue here is that if people don't want to feel like they're burdened with the situation that others have gotten themselves in, then we shouldn't make everybody responsible for it. We should get rid of universal health care so it is not our medical burden. We should privatize public education so it is not our educational burden. We should end up getting rid of the welfare state so it is not our financial burden in that respect. And then it's incumbent upon families, private charities, a community that is concerned about these issues to reach out and, make, and bridge the gap. That's up to them. I mean, I'm no social Darwinist. I don't firmly believe that an alcoholic in this gutter is exactly where he should be. I think it's incumbent upon communities, local communities, neighborhoods, families, to reach out and help people who have an addiction. But by and large, most people who use narcotics just do so recreationally. It's not an addiction necessarily. And what one chooses to put in their body is their prerogative, and the state should have no business saying so. So... Um, and then as far as the drug war goes, obviously that has been largely motivated by two major factors, which is one, it's inherently racist and it's been done to penalize subgroups that were not in favor politically, and it's for economic profit. And you can see that even in the case of mandatory minimum sentencing regarding cocaine versus crack cocaine. Obviously crack cocaine, which is far more accessible to inner city African Americans, has a much heavier minimum sentence structure than cocaine does, which is preferred by white Wall Street types. So there's that aspect, and there's a huge profit to be made by the rehabilitation and the prison industrial complex by maintaining the war on drugs. So it absolutely has to be ended. And I assure you, courtesy of Yelp and the free market and word of mouth, we will get much better drugs and we'll probably make better decisions. All right, Arvin, we'll end with you. 
If I'm elected, I'm going to pardon everyone who's in jail for a drug related crime and nothing else. And that's going to be everyone who from somebody who just had a small amount of marijuana all the way up to people who are classified as kingpins, people like Ross Ulbricht, a great American techn technological innovator who should be out there creating jobs and innovation, not wasting time in a prison cell courtesy of the U.S. government. Did the U.S. government do something special for all the people who were victims of violent crime, which, were, which was caused by prohibition? As far as I remember, they didn't really do anything. Similarly, in this case, this is not something that the government needs to be involved with. It's true. It is true that at the moment, sometimes if somebody's making bad decisions, other people have to pay the penalty. But that doesn't mean we need to have government involved in it. It means we need to simply re remove the mechanism that allows people to be penalized for the idiocy of others. The reason that I want to end the welfare state is not just to encourage people to work hard. It is also to allow people greater freedom because it's a simple fact that many people can enjoy recreational drugs without becoming welfare parasites. Other people cannot. To use an example, in the New York Times, there was an article that showed that many employers could not find enough people to work that could pass a drug test. In other words, plenty of people were choosing marijuana over work. Now, I have believed that everybody has the right to make that decision. I think it's a stupid decision, but I think they and only they should pay the penalty for that decision. If the choice becomes between, right now the choice is between work or marijuana plus welfare, if that choice was instead between work and marijuana plus starvation, I think you're going to see a lot of different decisions being made. The government should not be adding taxes or anything. It should simply make sure that we end things like universal health care, government school education, and the entire welfare state so that we are not paying the penalty for the decisions of other people. Great. I am so glad you brought up Ross Ulbrich because that connects to my next question. We will have an entire debate about criminal justice, but we're going to dip our toe in a little bit on this one. The FBI has famously thwarted their own plots before. Bait cars are a technique that are used to get people off of the streets by putting a car, leaving the keys in them, and waiting for someone to steal it, and then arresting the person who steals it. Law enforcement officers, as well as members of the CIA and FBI, argue that this brings people off the streets who were going to commit a crime, as proven by the fact that they attempted to do so. Would you agree or disagree? Would you end this policy? continue it, what would you do with it? I will start with uh, Ms. Kim Ruff. <laughs> of course I would end it. That's entrapment. <laughs> That's totally unethical and <laughs> completely jacked. No, I would, I mean, most of the time with that stuff too, the assets that they use to bait people are taken from civil asset forfeiture, which again is also criminal. So yes, I would absolutely end it and I will yield my time. Okay. In the case of, uh, let me clarify, and I'll bring it back to you, Ms. Ruff, so you have a chance to answer. This includes people like Ross Ulbricht, who were set up to murder someone. They ordered the hit. The hit was not actually carried out because it was done with police. Would this include members like Ross Ulbricht? Well, Ross Ulbricht didn't murder anyone. <laughs> All he did was create a platform for economic free exchange that was basically running against the government. I mean, they weren't running against the government, but they created something that was far superior to what our government regulates. So he didn't murder anyone. As far as the murder plot goes, again, it's still entrapment. I think that's incredibly crappy to go to people. I mean, it's like what happened to Ruby Ridge. Now, he didn't murder anyone, but they hounded that poor man to give them a sawed-off shotgun. And he deferred multiple times, Randy Weaver did. And they kept counting him until he finally sold him a shot, sawed off shotgun. And then they're like, great, we're going to shoot him. <laughs> like That's just totally messed up. So yes, I would absolutely end a policy of entrapment. Mr. Vora, that question is for you. I would 100% end the policy of entrapment. And, and I want to speak to it a little bit more deeply. Uh, I had the opportunity recently to spend some time at the Maryland House of Delegates. And I saw so many issues come up that basically boiled down to one thing people being encouraged to have kids that they were not ready to have. Uh, one example was a situation where people were complaining that so many parents were given the free eye exams, given vouchers to get uh, glasses for their kids and just never bothered to use them. That's the level of irresponsibility that we're associating with parenting today. 
And ending the welfare state entirely is going to make that kind of criminal creating parenting impossible. And to me, ending the welfare state means ending all welfare, ending government schools, and ending any other thing that allows people to have kids that they are clearly financially and psychologically not ready to deal with. When it comes to entrapment, that's addressing the wrong side of it. Would I get rid of it? Yeah, absolutely. It's immoral. It's, it's ridiculous. Now, when it comes to entrapment for something bigger, let me give an example. Suppose you lock somebody in a cage, beat them senseless, sexually abuse them, and then let them out on the streets in a way that encourages them to commit some kind of assault. Yeah, they're probably going to do it, but it is something to do. Like You had something to do with that. All this kind of psychological damage done by the government to people in prison today leads to problematic behavior later on. And then they say, well, look, someone who did drugs later became a violent criminal. Right. Well, no kidding. You abused them for years. Of course they became that way. Okay. Uh, let's move on to Ben. Well, bait cars. This is, this is not the the worst thing that the, we see the police doing in this country or the worst problem that we have. Um, I can see certain, you know, scenarios to where if, if you had a, a lot of cars getting stolen in a neighborhood and you wanted to drop a bait car in there to try to figure out who was doing it, that, that, that seems like an effective way of figuring that out. Um, but of all the things that are going on domestically, as far as law enforcement is concerned, I mean, we see uh, you know thousands of people getting uh, blown away in, in the streets. Uh, sometimes maybe justified, a lot of times not. Um, and you know what? You know maybe we wouldn't have such a problem with this if we saw the same type of entrapment techniques being used against corrupt right. officials. Um, they seem to uh, never be caught and chris will end with you you know i i'm in line with it to agree with kim uh, kim on this one it is entrapment one of my favorite uh supreme court rulings um a judge say, it said that no public official with an iq above the room temperature in alaska would believe that they could that they could violate state or federal law um it, it, I think that that is what this all boils down to is we have an we, we do live in a society of entitled individuals and they just all seem to be government employees. They believe that they're entitled to commit uh, violate the law and they're immune. They don't have any liability in regard to this. And I think that it's high time that we start tasking our public officials to actually serve and protect the people's interests. Um, and that means that we have to actually task them with serving and protecting us against cr government corruption. And that's it. Uh, that I yield my time. Okay. Uh, next question. You'll have one minute to answer the following question. Career <laughs> politicians are seen as liabilities for liberty loving Americans, but the concept of term limits always fizzles out during the legislative and judicial process. Do term limits take away an option for the voter they are constitutionally allowed to have? Would you try to make something like this happen or encourage it? If so, how? And if not, why not? We will start with Mr. Letter. Um, term limits uh, are kind of a two-edged sword. Um, I've, heard, I've heard arguments on both sides. So, um, you know, one, one concern uh, that there is with term limits is like when we see uh, with the president every two years, at the, at the end of their term, they do all the, uh, the wilder, crazy stuff that they didn't want to do uh, earlier on. Uh, they do it at the, at the very end of their term. So term, not having term limits has a way of keeping people accountable and not doing that. But, and then also, you know, uh, term limits would prevent people like, uh, you know, Ron Paul and uh, other, you know, uh, you know, people that we, uh, we've looked up to uh, in the liberty movement uh, from making, uh, making it, uh, making the impact that they, uh, that they made, because the impact that they made was over the course of, uh, you know, multiple terms. So I, I, I think more conversation needs to be had on if, that actually has a value or not. Mr. Marks. 
Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm actually fully in, in support of term limits. I like that the president has uh, two terms that they can serve. I think that Congress, uh, it, the legislative branch itself, should have a maximum limit of, or a maximum of maybe three terms. That gives them, uh, gives them enough for time in office to actually get some footing in there um, to form the necessary uh, relationships with the other legislators to actually effectively propose and write the legislation that needs to be. But I also think that we need to have term limits, especially on the judicial branch. Um, I see that that uh, the judicial branch is being one of the most corrupt eight branches of government in this nation. And I think that it's because we have a bunch of attorneys that are formed a good old boys club and they think that they can get away with whatever they want to get away with. And we need to put a stop to that. Mr. Fora. I want to imagine two different situations. One situation is let's say we got rid of term limits that existed and that we're now in Gary Johnson's sixth or seventh term. He has dropped the state budget from a couple billion to say $500. There's basically no regulations. Government schools have been defunded as he's gotten more comfortable and then probably a little bit more radical. That's what would happen if we didn't have the term limits. The other states around them would have to compete with New Mexico, lowering their taxes, lowering their regulations. And today America would be freer if Gary Johnson had not been term limited. On the other hand, if Ron Paul had been term limited, what you would hear from, from a friend is you might meet some old timer that says, you know, I once saw this Texan speak. He was cool. I don't remember his name, Rob something or other. The simple fact is this. There is a shortage of people who have character and backbone. That's people like Gary Johnson and Ron Paul. Term limits are going to get rid of them. There is no limit to the number of people that are happy to be the lackeys of the military welfare complex or teachers unions. There'll right. always be more of those. I think term limits are a bad idea and I oppose them. And we'll end with you, Ms. Ruff. <laughs> okay, well, let me preface this by saying, outside of a bully pulpit, there's not much I can do about it. It requires a constitutional amendment and that's not something I can do. But yes, like Ben pointed out, there are good arguments on both sides of it. Somebody who's great, liberty-minded, yeah, of course we want them in perpetuity, please never die. <laughs> and then somebody who's terrible, we wanna get rid of them. But the reality is, is that incumbents are typically elected, re-elected 70% of the time. And it has precious little to do with their track record. You could have an incredibly terrible politician. And just because of the mere fact that they have name recognition, people still re-up on them. So there is a problem inherent in having in perpetuity or as long as you keep getting elected. Additionally, as we've come to see with the election cycles, people start campaigning midway through their term. They start to, they turn to, you know, two years in the House, and then the last two years, they're campaigning again for re-election, and they're not actually actively proposing legislation or voting on anything. So Fine. if you did have term limits, that's it. All right. You'll have one minute to answer the following question. Net neutrality forced internet providers to provide equal bandwidths and speeds over all of their domains. While critics were wrong, when, they no when we noticed that the end of net neutrality brought in faster internet speeds instead of slower ones, most people are still against forcing a company to behave in this certain way. Every internet provider without net neutrality lobbies politicians for additional licensing and regulations that create biases that are arguably worse than those under net neutrality. Would you, oppose, would you favor a system to replace net neutrality or do something that would help the internet age to be more open market, how would you approach it and what would you do or encourage? We'll start with you, Kim Ruff. A lot of the companies that are currently beneficiaries of these major, you know, that have a stronghold in certain areas is largely because they purchased or basically were grandfathered into cable companies. So they took on all those lines and then no other competing company was able to run fiber optics or cable to offer an alternate ISP. So if we actually ended up removing those previous contracts that had been got government, you know, grandfathered in, then we would allow greater plurality and competition. We wouldn't need government regulation to tell who should behave and who shouldn't. Because obviously Netflix is going to need a higher bandwidth than your crappy Hello Kitty website. So that's something that you do want, plurality. You want competition. You want a free market. And 
there's nothing government can do that it does well. So it should just get out of the way and allow the internet to do as it will. All right, Chris Marks. You know, I followed net, I, I followed net neutrality for a while there, and one of the things that I saw that it was supposed to be opposing is individual service providers um, paying off your internet service provider to throttle non-paying customers to and and holding you at a high, providing you a higher allotted bandwidth. Um, I think that that, if left unchecked, would result in in many cases, such as situations like we are libertarians. You would have to actually pay an I an IP provider to actually not be throttled down. Um, and amazing videos uh, such as this debate would not be allowed to actually be viewed at a streaming quality without buffering. Um, I think that this would require that we need to take a look into it. What is happening there? So, uh, Mr. Ben Letter. Um, the FCC is one of the creepiest agencies uh, in the game here. They, everything that we do in today's society uh, runs off radio frequency. What we're doing right now is running off radio frequency, like you know, Chris was mentioning. Um, everything. Um, and what have we seen? We've seen a few companies, you know, rise to the top. You know, they get the contracts on on the bandwidth. Like our cell phones, they operate on a, on a certain bandwidth frequency. Um, you know, I don't know if, if net neutrality is it was this great answer that the people said it was going to be, and I don't know if removing it uh, is is really much better. I don't know about you guys, but I haven't noticed much difference either way in my my internet experience. Time. Sorry. No. Oh, you're okay. You can wrap it up. <laughs> uh, we'll end with you, Arvin Vora. Just like successful companies can buy better real estate, I think it's perfectly legitimate for successful internet companies to buy better internet real estate and, and get better bandwidth, et cetera. What I want to see changed is a lot of the welfare built into a lot of internet laws, where if you look at your internet bill, in addition to paying for your own internet, you're also paying for internet for rural communities and all kinds of other things. And if you live in a rural community, by all means, pay for that internet. But if you don't, why is it your problem to pay for it? You pay more to live in a city. You should be able to also get the benefits of living there without having to subsidize somebody else's choice to live where it's cheaper. So in addition to getting rid of any kind of net neutrality, I think the answer is to get government entirely out of regulating the internet at all. Get rid of all of it, all special privileges, all regulation, everything. And I also want to see a complete removal of all welfare from internet. You pay for what you use and you shouldn't be forced to pay for anything else. Great. You'll have two minutes to answer the following question. Abortion has always been a difficult balance between a person's right to live and a person's right to decide what is right for their own body. In a slew of scandals over the past decade, a combination of testimonies, documents, and videos, and pictures have detailed thousands of live birth slow deaths to illegal organ, har organ harvesting to graphic footage of little clenching fingers seizing, seizing after a failure. With the alternative being the government telling people what they can or can't do with their bodies, is this simply a reality we must live with? That question's for you, Arvin. My view on abortion is very similar to my view on drugs. I don't support drugs. I don't encourage anybody to use drugs. And I spend a lot of time discouraging people from using drugs. I think that using drugs is morally wrong. And that makes me sometimes unpopular in libertarian circles, but I will say this, I don't think the government should be involved in it because the cost of government involvement is so much higher and so much more disgusting than just the drug use themselves, or the drug use itself. Similarly, I oppose abortion. I think it is morally wrong. I don't think it's something that should be done. If somebody asks me, I encourage them to do something else. If somebody doesn't ask me, I encourage them to do something else anyway. I do believe that human life is precious and I oppose abortion. But allowing the government to get involved in it is so much worse. The result of government involvement we've seen, 
back alley abortions, all kinds of terrible things happening outside of any kind of decency. I don't want to see that happening. The way I see it is this, at a fundamental biological level, no one is gonna care more about a child than that child's mother. And if that child's mother says that for whatever reason, some terrible disease that is gonna make sure that the child only lives for two years of agony and then dies, or whatever, if that child's mother decides that, I don't think the government should be countermanding it. Instead, we should be working towards more of a culture of responsibility. The culture should say, listen, have kids when you're ready to. Have sex when you're ready to procreate. Don't just have unprotected sex willy-nilly without any regard for the consequence. I don't think abortion should be anybody's primary form of birth control. That is just silly and morally reprehensible. I wanna see a lot fewer abortions in America. And I believe the way to do that is a culture of responsibility, not by having the government turn it into a disgusting black market for abortions, which we've already seen the consequences of in America. And I don't wanna repeat that failed mistake. That is two minutes on the dot. Ben, that's you. Um, this is one of those things I think the Libertarian Party platform gets it right. Uh, Arvin just uh, spoke uh, pretty well there uh, on the subject. Um, I don't think the federal government should be involved in it whatsoever. I don't think it should be a federal issue. We got 50 different states. Uh, you know, perhaps if they want to take up that issue on the state level, that's state level business. I don't think the federal government should be involved in, in this issue and, and a whole lot of other issues uh, for that uh, matter. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris Marks to you. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I've, I've actually had this conversation with a number of people. I'll explain my personal view is um, I can't have an abortion. Um, I can be with somebody or choose not to be with somebody based off of their decision to have an abortion if I have a vested interest in it or even just being in a relationship with them. So if a woman has an abortion and, it just so, and it's our child that she has an abortion, I can't do anything about that. It's her body. It's her choice. It's her right. Um, I have the right and the choice to whether or not to be with her or not. Um, the government. The government doesn't have a the limited privilege to be involved in the reproductive rights of the people. I don't believe that to be the case at the federal level nor at the state level. Um, merely, I think, yes, we need to take personal responsibility. We need to take into understanding that, you know, if you are not ready to have a child, then maybe you should take certain steps to not do that. But that is, again, a moral decision, it's an ethical decision, and it's not one that the federal government nor the state government should be involved in. Okay. Kim Ruff, two minutes. <laughs> like, hi, I'm a woman. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> um, no, Arvin did a beautiful job. I, I mean, really, there's, there's not a whole heck of a lot I could add to it. He's absolutely right on the money. It is something that like himself, I find personally morally reprehensible. My daughter was a surprise, but because I have poor personal moral objections to abortion, personal responsibility dictates carry to term, take care of her, she is my duty. And that's the way that I view things. But in the same token, I don't think it's my job to put my moral beliefs onto anybody via the instrument of government. And for that reason, I do think that we should encourage and aid each other we should, maybe we could create sponsorship programs that are completely independent of government, where if it is truly important to you to see somebody carry a life to term, maybe you can help them by, you know, caring for them or whatever. There's community-based things that you can do without turning to a monopoly on force to compel other people to action. And like Arvin pointed out, when you do do that, you create a black market and the ramifications of that are far, far, far worse. So yeah, he did a great job. <laughs> Okay. You have two minutes to answer the following question. Affirmative action forces colleges and employers to diversify. Women and minorities are wildly underrepresented among certain industries, especially engineering, tech, and piloting. Studies by the ACLU, Huffington Post, and others have shown that colleges and workplaces that diversify, even by mandated force, outperform those that do not. 
It is argued that affirmative action forces a legal change when social biases and prejudices hold us back. Do you agree? If so, why? If you disagree, how would you assure minorities that this discrimination is only temporary? Mr. Letter. Um, I keep hearing uh, in the news that there's all this racism going on, um, but frankly, um, I think it's 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 largely overstated. Um, I grew up and, and went to school in a, a very diverse school. Um, I didn't, you know, it, it just, you know, I mean, you hear about what was going on in the 1800s, but things, things are, are, are different today. I don't know if we need uh, federal legislation uh, mandating uh, who gets into what college uh, based upon some type of uh, criteria or who gets a job based upon some type of criteria. I think the, the most qualified individual uh, should get the job. And I think that the most qualified individual will get the job uh, no matter uh, what their uh, racial makeup or you know, what, whatever have you there. Um, employers uh, want to make money and they hire people that are good at their jobs, regardless of what they look like. Okay, uh, Mr. Marks. You know, I think that in a free market society, um, we need to a, we need to understand that any kind of government regulation that would impart a duty or a responsibility uh, for an employer to go one way or another in regard to their selection of their potential employee is completely out of line to a capitalistic view. Uh, you know, we need to, uh, we as a society, uh, and I don't think that there's anything that should be legislated to actually re-guide the understanding of our society. We need, I, but I am firmly underneath the belief that the employee has the resp responsibility of knowing their worth. Um, when I go into an interview, I close it up with, I look forward to hearing back from you. Um, I'm a, I will, go, when I accept a contract, I stick with that contract and I stay the contract. Um, and I'm generally juggling numerous empl possible employers. I don't view that the employer is doing me, a cer doing me any favors by giving me a job. They're hiring me because I am a qualified, highly educated, um, highly skilled individual. Um, I'm doing my employer a favor by being their employee. And I think that we need that to instill that in our society. You're doing the employer a favor by working for them and make sure that you value yourself to work hard, to make that under, make that employer respect what you're doing for them. Now, I don't think that that needs to be something that we legislate, but we need women, we need minorities, we need all of these people to understand that they're hard workers because quite frankly, in the time period, that I've met individuals, some of the hardest working individuals I've ever met were illegal immigrants, honestly. Two minutes on the button. Arvin. From a moral level, affirmative action is, is wrong. You're using force to make somebody make a decision. It's, it's racist, it has those, those problems, but the worst thing about it is that it just is ineffective for what it's trying to do. The goal of affirmative action is to change cultural perception so that we get rid of this level of racism. And I think the way that we should do it is what has already worked, much to the chagrin of a lot of racists, what has already worked in athletics. In athletics, there, are no, there is no affirmative action. Whoever's the best gets to play. And what that's done is the old belief that no one could possibly athletically ever compete with whites has been thrown out the window. And we realize that people of all races can compete in the world of professional sports. We need to have Jackie Robinsons, not just in baseball, but in every industry, in tech, in medicine, in everything. We need to go back to the fact and remember things like, for example, that the first open heart surgery was performed not by a white person, but by an African-American doctor. These are the people who should be changing cultural perception. If we get rid of all racial preference, and I do mean every last drop of it, no one's ever going to be able to say again, Oh yeah, he just got into Harvard because of his race. Oh, he just got that job because of his race. 
every single successful minority in a world without affirmative action would be living proof that racism is just simply scientifically wrong, that it is backwards, and that it is stupid. I want to end affirmative action not because I hate minorities. I'm a minority. I want to end affirmative action because I know that's the way to actually change cultural perception. We can do in every part of life what we have successfully done in sports, which is to completely eradicate racism, make there be no excuse, no way that someone could say, well, it's just because of their race. If I'm elected, I'm going to do everything I can to get rid of all types of affirmative action, both at the federal level and for federal contractors. Kim. I, I agree wholeheartedly with Arvin. <laughs> um, but to dovetail into the points that he had made, one of the things about it, too, is that as somebody who's a member of a protected class, I find it, frankly, offensive. I find it offensive that people think that I'm so utterly incapable that we would need to compel somebody to hire me over somebody else who could possibly qualify more. I work in manufacturing, which is a male-dominated industry. I'm a director of operations. I run the company when my boss is not around. And... Yes, I don't do that because we live in a state where I'm forced to be hired. I live in a right to work state. I got there because I'm good at what I do. So I would rather be able to feel like I'm successful because I earned it and not because somebody was told they had to take me on. So it's incredibly patronizing. And in addition to that, it also is grounds for breeding resentment. If, you know, as Arvin pointed out, if you want to eradicate racism, you cannot compel people to feel good about each other. You let them do what they do and prove by their own merit that they are just as worthy. When you force other people to accept others and you do it at the expense of the meritocracy, then what you do is breed greater resentment because then they think, well, that guy's only here because of this, as opposed to he's really good at what he does and he enhances our entire experience by being part of this. So yeah, I'm totally against affirmative action. I think it's deeply unhealthy and it's actually set us back to some extent. All right, you'll have one minute to answer the following question. The government will often give citizens the price of a property if it has better community use. This, proper, this process is called eminent domain. Corruption regarding this practice is well documented. But if someone is sitting on land that could make the community millions of dollars, is it truly advisable to allow the owner to hold back financial gain for everyone, including him or herself, just because they refuse to sell for a sentimental reason? What if this blocks sewage or electrical access to other parts of the community? Ben, one minute. Um, MN domain's been a popular subject lately. Um, it's, it's in the Constitution. Uh, the, the spirit of eminent domain was, you know, if the nation was under attack, you know, we could build a, we could build a fort here or things like that. Um, we've seen eminent domain really get abused. Um, you know, somebody, uh, as a matter of fact, who just announced for president, uh, Beto O'Rourke has been known to uh, participate in the, uh, the cronyism uh, involving eminent domain to muscle people out of their property uh, on behalf of their, their friends. Um, that's, that's not a healthy use of eminent domain. And, and I don't approve of that. And I don't, I don't think anyone else here does uh, either. Let's find out. Arvind Vora. <laughs> when you buy real estate, part of it is an investment and you have the right to buy real estate and do nothing with it, knowing that because of its location, somebody else might want to do something. And if they want to do that thing, that's going to make them a lot of money. They might need to pay you a lot extra. In terms of pipes and electrical, you know, I have never heard of this special kind of pipe that can only go in a straight line and cannot have any bends the way all normal plumbing in the whole world does. I've never heard of an electrical wire that cannot be bent the way all electrical wires on earth do. Think about how much you bend your bone charging cord and they still work. That's how electricity works. Those are just excuses. If I'm elected, I'm going to shut down eminent domain abuse. I'm going to shut down eminent domain use for anything, unless there's something that's so extreme, so necessary for national security that there's no other possible way. I cannot imagine that happening. The odds against it are astronomical. So I oppose eminent domain. I will shut it down. I will end the abuse of, end the abuse of it if I'm elected. Chris? As an American Indian, I am well aware of the abuse of eminent domain in regard to American Indian reservation lands. 
I'm, uh, I'm able to actually empathize with the uh, common man and woman that would have the government infringe on their private property and steal it. There's no, it, there, it, I don't care whether or not it's in the Constitution, and this is where I'm going to actually take a hard break, break from my strict constitutional values. Um, eminent domain, there's nothing acceptable about it. It's nothing but crony capitalism through and through. I yield my time. Okay. And, uh, Kim. oh yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> still the last one already. Kim, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I absolutely agree. I'm vehemently opposed to eminent domain. If somebody happens to be fortunate enough to be sitting on, you know, a oil shale or something, then, you know, good on them. <laughs> they can sell it to everybody else if it's going to benefit them. I am not a utilitarian. I don't think it's acceptable to harm somebody because it's going to benefit the greater good. And the fact that we use monopoly on force to do so is incredibly cruel. So yeah, eminent domain is not okay. There's, as Arvin very <laughs> charmingly put, <laughs> you can work around it. <laughs> awesome. You'll have one minute to answer the following question. Social security is legitimately paid for by citizens. Unlike many of the other programs, if government reduces the burden of social security, it means we give retirees a worse deal than the one we already promised them. We are already behind $20 trillion in payments to retirees. Do we break our promise to these people to go into less debt and what do we do going forward? To, uh, you know what, I said one minute, we're gonna give you two. Ben, go ahead. Social Security is a Ponzi scheme. Just look up the definition of Ponzi scheme. It's it's right in front of your face. It's a it's a bad deal. Um, it's a bad deal designed to look like a good deal, kind of like the pack the Patriot Act. Um, I think we need to get rid of the Social Security program. I think we need to refund uh, everybody's money. Uh, I think the government has has perpetrated. Uh, a massive crime upon the people uh, and needs to give everybody their money back. Um, that's, that's what I think we need to do with social security. And when people have their money back, they can choose to do with whatever they want with it. Okay. Kim, two minutes to you. I agree wholeheartedly. I do think that you know, as Ben said, there's probably a picture of Social Security, although I don't know how you would draw it in the dictionary right under Ponzi scheme. <laughs> but yes, absolutely. People have contributed to this bullshit system. Yes, I cursed. I'm sorry. And I think that we should reimburse them the money that we've taken and call it a day. They should be responsible for making their own retirement accounts. There's multiple ways that you can do that that have nothing to do with government. So allow them that opportunity. Stop taking their money. And while we're at it, how about we give them back their taxes? I could have given you guys 30 seconds on this one. Chris, go ahead. Yes, please. <laughs> I'm actually probably going to be a little bit long-winded on this one. Um, social, security, social security system. It's a trust fund. It's so, the Social Security Trust Fund. Uh, the United States is the trustee. You are the trustor as somebody who has contributed to it, into it. Did you know in 2009, Congress borrowed $2 billion from your trust funds? Did you know that annually the United States federal legislative branch mismanages those, that social security trust fund to the tune of $50 billion by paying your state governments while the individual trustors only receive less than $30 billion a year? Everybody's claiming that this is a Ponzi scheme. It's not. It's just a mismanaged trust fund. The United States federal government owes you billions upon billions upon billions of dollars. And as a government by the people and for the benefit of the people, maybe we need to reinvent, we need to relook at what it, the, what the federal government trustee is doing with your money. And I yield my time. Okay. We'll close with you, Arvin. My solution to social security is simple. Shut the program down, pay back to people what they paid into it, and then we're done with it. That's, that's the whole thing. How do we pay that debt off? I support Harry Brown's vision, which was to sell off government land to pay down that social security. 
right now the federal government is selling off government land not to pay down social security but to pay down federal pensions and the idea that federal government workers you know workers being used very generously here should be getting special privilege i don't support that one bit i used to be an actuary and i can tell you how you would predict that somebody is going to turn 65 you have 65 years of warning this is not a surprise, no matter what the government tells you, this is not something that caught them off guard. They couldn't possibly expect it that 65 years after someone was born, they were gonna turn 65 years old. It is, as Chris said, pure mismanagement. What we should do is get rid of it and let people buy private annuities. It's just like government schools. Get rid of government schools and let people pay for education that works. Get rid of government mismanaged retirement and let people buy retirement that actually works. One final thing I want to add to that, there are people who come to America when they're 80, never paid a dime into it, and get supplemental security income or other things that are basically funded by the same, by the same system. That's an absolute travesty. If you've never paid into it, you don't deserve one cent. And I'll shut that down too. Okay. We're going to get into the uh, listener questions now. I open this up to the listeners of the program and people who listen to you do your interviews with us. And they had the following questions to ask you. This question was submitted by Julio Alejandro Freeman the 10th, and you'll have one minute to answer it. We have an entire de debate dedicated to immigration, but let's, let, let's just wade the waters into it just a little bit for one minute here. What does the libertarian position accommodate identitarians, nativists, and xenophobes? Should we draw a line? There are already so few libertarians in number. Do we risk fracturing a party by taking hardline positions when, this, when even prominent libertarians, especially paleo libertarians, have been a big part in building the party into what it is today? And we will start with Ms. Ruff. I'm sorry, I'm not fully understanding the question. The first part about identitarians, xenophobes, and could you please repeat that? Of course. Does the libertarian position accommodate identitarians, nativists, and xenophobes? Should we draw a line? Basically asking uh, the, the paleos, those who uh, pro-wall, anti, I guess, immigrants, those who think that uh, maybe manifest de destiny individuals, uh, should, we, sh should we encourage them to be part of the liberty movement? Should we discourage them? Do we need to draw a line? What should we do with them today? And one minute. Well, if they're hell-bent on building a wall, they're perfectly welcome to do so around their personal property. If they have issue with the fact that there are government services or programs that they are paying into that are being used to fund people they prefer it not to fund, then they have issues with welfare or public education or universal health care, and those are things that need to be attacked rather than people who come to the country. Additionally, I think that all public land should be privatized and it would be incumbent upon the people who own the property to make the determination whether or not they wanted somebody on it. But as far as trying to restrict the movement of people, if private property is the way that rules, and it, ideally it would in an anarcho-capitalist society, then you know, nobody really has a right to the free movement. You, know, you have to ask for permission. And if somebody says no dice, it's not going to happen. By I don't know that that's necessarily an appeal to identitarian xenophobes or any other subgroup that kind of holds racist viewpoints. I think that they're just basically grossly misled on what they're angry about. Sure. Uh, ben. Have you ever met anybody that personally identified as a xenophobe? <laughs> I can't say that I have. These are, these are just labels that people come up with to project on the people. Uh, you're not libertarian enough. Uh, what gives me the right to be the gatekeeper of the liberty movement or any, any of us or, or anybody else for that matter? Um, you know, it, just because somebody has one view on one situation, to throw uh, an overarching label onto them is, 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 is ridiculous. I've never been a fan of these labels. I don't subscribe to them. Thank you. Arvin. I'm an anarcho-capitalist. I oppose borders. I believe there should be no borders and no welfare. That said, I do believe that there is a minarchist position that says the government should control have borders. You know, Milton Friedman said that if we have a welfare state, we need to have border protections. And I don't think I'd be comfortable with kicking out Milton Friedman from the liberty movement. 
What we need to do instead is to just be clear about what libertarianism is. If I want to say the grossest violation of people misrepresenting libertarianism, it's not borders, it's government schools, because there is no room for it in minarchism, anarchism, classical liberalism, or any other type of libertarianism. Open borders is my position. Open borders, no welfare. I'll also take just open borders. But the idea that we should keep somebody out, I don't know even how we would do that. We should keep somebody out because they have a position that we disagree with. That's not something I'm really comfortable with. I will, however, be working to persuade people, probably in a not necessarily super polite method, I'll be working to persuade people that open borders and no welfare is a far better solution than letting government mismanage immigration the way it mismanages everything else. And Chris? Um, I think that I, I, these people I often ask, well, why do you think that these immigrants are actually trying to come into this nation? Well, and they always go back to, so they can get our, so, so they can get our social welfare program, a profit from our social welfare programs. And I go, well, did they pay into the said program? Are they a trust or? If they are not, then you really don't have a problem with the illegal immigrants. What you have a problem with is the federal legislative branch mismanaging your trust funds. If you resolve that issue, illegal immigrants coming in here and doing work through the uh, through uh, with employers through a free enterprise, it's really not doing you any harm. And if your if your argument is, is they're taking my jobs then maybe you need to work harder. <laughs> okay. Uh, one minute. And we have very few successful libertarian politicians. One of them, though, on the local level, did feel the need, and he's a successful libertarian po uh, politician. He, is, he felt the need to ask this question of you guys. His name is Danny Lundy, and you'll get two minutes to answer this. Well, we will have two minutes, two deb different debates about economy, and so you'll get a ton more time to answer this question. We'd like the two-minute answer on this. For now, America is behind $122 trillion that is owed to our own citizens. On top of this, we have $22 trillion in loans represented by our debt. Give me a quick overview of how we pay this off and get back on the right track. And we will start with Mr. Letter. Well, we're gonna have to cut spending. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to cut spending tremendously. Um, maybe we can't uh, afford uh, all these programs. That's just the simple the simple reality as I see it, and I think uh, as, as a lot of people see it. We we can't afford all these programs. We can't afford all these all these agencies. We can't afford all this uh, government bureaucracy and infrastructure. Uh, that's that's where the fat is, uh, the pork. Um, that that can be eliminated, and until we eliminate that, the, we're never going to pay down uh, any debt until spending is reduced, and not by by a little bit, by a lot. And I think that we need to start relying more upon uh, the. The framers' vision of the uh, the, the well-regulated militia for our, our national defense uh, that could that could reduce a lot of spending right there. Um, the same concept of the volunteer fire department we could see that in in some other agencies uh, as as well uh, and and reduce costs there locally too. Uh, the public education. Um, a lot of money gets wasted there just on football stadiums. Uh, we have to cut spending. That's the first thing. And until that happens and without that happening, there will be no progress on, on paying down the debt. There's no point in talking about anything else if we're not going to talk about that. Great. Uh, Miss Kim Ruff. Well, if we play the game where we pretend government is a business, there are a couple ways you get to go about handling things if you happen to be deeply, deeply in the red. One is you cut, um, you increase revenue. And in this case, that would be basically, since government is not in the business of making or selling anything, they're in the business of stealing money and redistributing it, that would be raising taxes, which is fundamentally wrong and we vehemently oppose libertarians, so that option's out. The next one would be reduce your assets. So you could sell off public land, you could get rid of things that the government quote unquote owns, and that would help free up money to help pay off the debt. 
Additionally, you can reduce payroll. So you can start closing agencies and getting rid of people who work for the government. And that would save you a huge chunk of change. So if you end up doing those things, you reduce the size and scope of government and you free up a huge chunk of capital that should never have been ours in the first place because they shouldn't have taken it. And you can use that to pay off the debt. So as long as we're reducing government and getting rid of all of this superfluous nonsense, which from my perspective is all of it, then I think we could absolutely get rid of the debt and we would be a much, much greater society. Mr. Chris Marks. Uh, as president of the United States Federal Corporation, 28 USC 300215A, um, the first thing that I would do is I go through all, all of the executive orders, repeal all a non-constitutional, a unconstitutional executive orders, and all of the subsequent deep state agencies and operations that are actually encar encouraging us to actually have a higher cost of government operations. Then after I did that, what I would do is I would a, create a program because a government is a business. It just doesn't have an honest revenue stream. And I would task, uh, task our state governments with creating a renewable energy electricity and using the proceed, proceeds from that electric, renewable resource electricity to actually fund all governmental operations with a certain one third allotment going to actually um, contributing, a, contributing to the people who actually funded said development of governmental operations. Then base our national economy off of how much, domestically on how much renewable energy resources we can produce as a nation and then internationally we are a leverage our a constitutionally printed funds the, underneath article 1 section 8 um, based off of the overall national GDP and then end the relationship with the Federal Reserve banking institution and establish a uh, payment program so that we can pay off that debt that we owe to them because currently our, last time I checked, the Federal Reserve was car charging us 26% on the dollar for, and I believe that was compounded quarterly. Okay, two minutes on the dot. We'll end with you, Mr. Arvindvora. The United States government is essentially operating as a failed business. And the first thing that I would do as president is shut down the welfare state, both domestically. And what that means is ending all types of welfare, individual welfare, corporate welfare, encouraging states to abolish government schools, and really doing everything we can to reduce spending. But our welfare, unfortunately, does not end at our borders. We currently have military welfare, through which the United States, acting as a world police, basically provides free military for every country on Earth. And I'm going to shut that down. France, Saudi Arabia, Israel, they can pay for their own military. And if they can't, well, then hopefully whoever conquers them is going to be able to pay for their own military. Uh, in terms of raising revenue, there are ways to do that that I believe are constitutionally legitimate. You guys probably remember from history class things like the Louisiana Purchase, uh, the Gadsden Purchase, you know, Seward's Folly, the United States buying up sovereign land. Sovereign land is one of the most valuable assets on earth, and the United States has a lot of it. I want the federal government to do the reverse of that, sell off sovereign land. I want to see a thousand Hong Kong type, type micronations throughout the United States giving the federal government competition. That's what happens when a business fails, other smaller businesses establish themselves and compete. And I want to see that happening. The federal government, I think it should basically be non-existent. I think that the states should be competing against each other. And I think that counties should be competing against each other. And hell, I would love to see individual homesteads competing against each other to provide better, lower taxes, better regulation, etc. The way to balance the budget is to cut spending. And that's cutting domestic spending and welfare and cutting foreign spending on military welfare. If I'm elected, I'm going to end all welfare, both foreign and domestic. Okay, two minutes. Uh, this question was from our listener, Daryl W. Perry. You'll have one minute to answer it. Do you believe all inhabitants have an equal right to vote in state and federal elections? Why or why not? Keep in mind, this includes felons, those in prison, and illegal immigrants. We'll start with Arvin. 
The only people that I would legitimately consider not allowing to vote are people who are able to vote for themselves a pay increase. That means federal workers for federal elections and state workers for state elections. This is an established principle. Congressmen are not allowed to vote for a pay increase for themselves. They can only vote for a pay increase for the next Congress. Uh, similarly, right now when you have federal workers, teacher unions, basically creating these organizations that go around voting for big government so that they get a pay raise, that's the only restriction that I want to put in, if any. I'm not saying that I necessarily do, but that's the only one that I would consider. If your life is being affected by laws, et cetera, then you have the right to vote against that. Uh, that said, I still believe that voting to steal money from someone else is immoral, and I don't think that any person has that type of right under any circumstance whatsoever. Okay. Uh, Chris Marks, one minute. I think that it, voting requires you to have paid a that you have to actually prove that you're paying into the system of a system of the government offer a governmental operations. Um, it requires you to maintain a maintain a legal status. I will not like waver on that one, um, but. Uh, felons, um, after a felon has served their time in a, a failed correctional institution, I don't see why it is that they wouldn't, uh, that why they would be precluded from voting after said service of time. Okay. And I but, yield my time. All right. Benjamin. Um, well, of course, uh, I'm pro uh, felons being able to vote. Uh, we've seen uh, a lot of states uh, turn their laws here uh, recently uh, and millions of uh, felons get added to the, to the voter rolls. Um, on the subject of uh, illegal aliens, uh, uh, that's the term we're gonna go with. Uh, that's uh, like, you know, a, a subject that you know, I kind of look at you know, to, to vote within uh, our convention, uh, our Libertarian National Convention, for instance, uh, you have to uh, at least be a, a member. Um, and uh, you know, to vote in uh, you know, uh, an annual shareholder meeting for a, a company, you have to own a share of stock. Um, I would you know, I would wonder why why somebody who wasn't interested in becoming a citizen uh, would would want to Fine. vote. Uh, perhaps we should uh, have a program where uh, people who are on within the pathway to citizenship uh, can vote, kind of like a driver's permit, maybe a, a voter's permit. Okay. Um, and that and way uh, they can vote on the laws that are affecting them while they're here pursuing citizenship. Sure. Okay, uh, and we'll end, Kim, with you. I think that if I think anybody who lives in an area and who's in who's affected by the policies and positions held by their government, regardless of their status as a citizen, whether or not they quote unquote pay into the system, they absolutely have skin in the game. Their lives are affected, and therefore they should have a right to say their piece about it. So I don't think that it, you know I understand the argument that you know within a certain community you have to meet certain criteria and you need to have paid into the system. I, I get it. You want people to have a skin in the game, but whether they've paid into it or not, they are affected by it, particularly felons. Felons have been the most affected, so they absolutely should have a right to vote. In Arizona, we are one of, I believe, 11 states that still maintains that somebody who's been convicted of a felony is unable to have their voting rights restored in perpetuity. That's totally unacceptable. So yes, absolutely. If you're affected by it, you should have a say. Okay, one minute on the button. We've got two more questions before our, our wrap up statements. This question was submitted by the, uh, the very famous Sarah Daggers and you will have one minute to answer it. <clears throat> Sex work is dangerous work with participants experiencing high levels of violence, homicide, harassment, incarceration, and medical fees. What is your stance on sex work? If you're against it, how do you explain this and how do you coincide it with your focus on freedom? If you are for it, how would you keep the immorality and expenses from spreading to Americans and, uh, and, and the taxpayers? And we will start with uh, Mr. Chris Marks. You know, I think that sex work, um, 
You know, what happens between two privately consenting adults, um, even in free enterprise, I don't believe the, the government has the ability to impair individual contracting. Um, you know, but that there, there is the uh, an alternative argument, and that is one of a social concern on like ensuring that sex workers uh, remain STD clean um, so that they're not a vessel to spread um, a health concern across, a, 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 well, within a region. Um, it's a, it, it, I think it's a tough one, but then, you know, when it comes down to it, then you have to go, well, is it an, an, an individual enterprise or did they incorporate? Did, it, are they involving themselves in the Commerce Clause, Commerce Clause where then Time. government would have a leg, legislative or a constitutional aspect in the game? So, Okay. Uh, let's move on to Ms. Kim Ruff. Okay, well, full disclosure, Sarah's my best buddy in big toe. <laughs> so I just want to put that out there for the audience. Like, she's my best friend. That being said, she's a sex worker advocate. So I actually haven't been coached on this question. <laughs> so, um, oh, well, that wasn't a very good friend thing to do. No, no, I think it's, I think it's fair and equitable to all of you guys. So I'm just going to, you know, swing at this one and see if I miss. So my feeling on it is, is that what one chooses to do with their body is their prerogative. And if they can make money on it, good on them. I wish I could. I'm not that good. <laughs> so, but, you know, I mean, basic economics. I think it's totally, sorry, I didn't mean to make you guys blush. <laughs> my parents are like, oh my God. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, what one does with their body is their prerogative. And if you have a truly free market system, if word gets out that somebody is not being hygienic or healthy or that they are engaging in criminal activity in the sense that they are defrauding people or they're harming them, then they're not going to be profitable at what they do. Unfortunately for sex workers, and this is just the horror of the situation, Time. because they are so morally demonized, they are the most, they are the most affected class. All right, Mr. Arvinvora. I've said this before, sex work is work, government work is theft. The issues around sex work are largely caused by the fact that it's banned in many areas. It makes people have a harder time getting business. Uh, there's a lot of government restrictions on advertising that I'm going to get rid of entirely. You, can, you should be able to advertise your business wherever and whenever you want. Um, and that creates that type of violence. I want you to think about how so many of us have now, since we don't trust companies that much, we start, have started reading ingredients whenever we buy something. That level of care is how people care about their bodies. And that level of detail is something that consumers demand. If this was brought out of the shadows and into the open, consumers would, out of purely out of self-interest and self-protection, want to have that kind of information. What methods are being used? Is this person safe to be with, etc.? So I believe in ending all laws against sex work. I believe that it is part of the role of a president to advocate for all Americans, not just you know, the most uprighteous Americans. And I absolutely will advocate for sex, for sex workers and for their businesses. All right, Ben. <clears throat> um, has the war on sex workers ended sex work any more than the war on drugs has ended drug use? No. Um, so it's another situation where we're wasting a bunch of government time and money that maybe could be used to pay down the debt that we were talking about earlier. Uh, some of the benefits of uh, allowing sex work uh, into the legitimate marketplace would be that uh, sex workers, they could, for instance, they could be, they could be insured and bonded, maybe. Uh, the, the, you know, there could be uh, clinics uh, that check the, the STDs and all that kind of stuff. Then, you know, you can certify and maintain uh, perhaps uh, sex worker insurance. Uh, a lot of industries could blossom off of it rather than spending a bunch of money with law enforcement to chase around uh, people in the streets Fine. trying to bust them and throw them in a cage. It doesn't even end up stopping the behavior or the, or the trade. Gotcha. All right. Last question before we move into our closing statements. This quick question was submitted by my personal real life high school friend, Jody Ingram, and you will have two minutes to answer this. It regards police brutality. How do we make sure it is addressed when it happens? 
How do we reassure members of the minority community that we're taking their complaints seriously? How do we show every American that they are safe living and working in our country? And we'll start with Kim Ruff. Well, you hold them accountable to the same standards you hold the citizenry. So this uh, putting people on paid leave and having these never come to bear or go to court, if you inflict harm on somebody, you should be held accountable into the same standards. In fact, I would almost think as the enforcement arm of the state, you should be held to greater accountability and greater standards. So that's what I would, I would advocate for. I think that there should be, additionally, I think that we should also demilitarize the police. That's another thing that's completely and wildly inappropriate. The fact that we are giving them military equipment in order to do what's supposed to be, you know, work, walk the beat seems pretty wildly inappropriate and has inflicted great harm. So I think that's the best I could do. And I hope this doesn't jeopardize your friendship with your high school buddy. I, I don't think it will. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Arvind Vora. Before you pass a law, you should recognize that enforcing that law may result in somebody's death. And so if something is not worth killing over or potentially killing over, it should not be a law. I'm not willing to kill somebody to stop them from smoking marijuana. It's one of the many reasons that I oppose the war on drugs. The way to end police brutality starts with ending police involvement in areas where the police should not be involved at all. And part of what I'm gonna do there is I'm gonna take on the role of partner in chief. And I'm just pardoning about everyone that does anything that doesn't have a clear actual victim. All sex workers, all gun, people whose only crime is gun possession, cryptocurrency users, drug users, drug kingpins like Ross Ulbricht, uh, people who violate quote national security, people like Julian Assange, those are the people who I'm gonna pardon right away and I'm gonna keep on pardoning until the police get the message that if you aren't going after a real legitimate threat, that person is going to walk free. So quit wasting your time interfering with people's rights. The way to end police brutality begins with that, but it doesn't end there. Kim is right. Police need to be held to the, at least the same standard, if not a higher standard, than the average citizen. The way to do that is to stop this ridiculous approach where they never see trial because they're friends with the DA or whatever, and instead make sure that they're being absolutely held accountable. The fundamental source of all of this, though, really does come down to this fundamental principle, which is that if you're not worth kill, if you're not willing to kill over a law, don't have the law. And I would repeal, and I would work to repeal or pardon, uh, or end through pardoning the vast majority of laws, including all victimless crimes. And I would let anything, only the very, very tiny percentage of things left, be something that was the purview of any kind of law enforcement. Great. Two minutes, uh, uh, Mr. Benjamin Letter. Oh, first, body cameras. Um, and the, they shouldn't have, uh, the same department shouldn't have access to the video room because I've seen body camera footage come up missing and allegedly the guys in the video room, they, they did that. Um, and also departments shouldn't be able to investigate themselves. You know, I wouldn't be opposed to, and I'm, I'm kind of wondering why this doesn't exist. It's, it's much pro law enforcement as there is in this country. How come there's not a, an agency of some kind that specifically investigates government officials and law enforcement, it doesn't have the ability to arrest a, a common citizen, but can only go after these individuals? How come something like that doesn't exist. There's no mechanism to hold these departments accountable. It's really oh, some of these small towns, like you said, the, the DA, the judge, the, the, they all know each other and they're not going to go after each other. So we need some type of mechanism to hold them accountable. Okay. Uh, Christopher Marks, two minutes. Public accountability and oversight. Currently, the way that our government works is that if you are a government employee and you actually have charges or are indicted for anything, it is held through it is held in an administrative procedure. There is no jury. There's just a bench of your fellow coworkers that are protecting you while they're protect while they're covering their own butts. This is due to the lack of public accountability and oversight. In this nation, we're supposed to have a fourth branch of government, 
and that is we the people. We need to reinst reinst reinstitute those those beliefs, those fundamental and those practices. If the government is unwilling to indict its own its own employees, then we need to create. We need to form a grand jury. We need to indict them. We need to try them in the courts in front of a jury of peers, a grand jury. And that is the way that we actually hold public servants accountable for the crimes that they commit. Okay, candidates, this is your time. Three minutes to make a, a pitch, your final closing statements to anybody who might have been listening about domestic policy, anything that you feel didn't get answered correctly, any contesting that you wanted to have with another candidate's question, anything you wanted to clarify, anything we didn't get to. You've got three minutes. We will start with you, Miss Kim. Oh, geez. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I guess probably the thing that I should address at this moment is my sense of humor, since that sometimes gets me into hot water. And while some people might find it charming, they also might think that I take things too lightly. I want to be perfectly clear about my sense of humor. Like many people who live in a world that is full of suffering, we, I use humor as a way of dealing with it. It's a coping mechanism. But I'm not joking about the things that I'm talking about. I'm not joking about the enormous force and fraud that is being inflicted upon the American people every day because of our tyrannical government. I'm not joking about how far afield we are from peace, prosperity, and progress because we have been indoctrinated into this mindset since the day of our birth that government is not only necessary, but it is good. So the reason why I am running for office, and in fact, why I'm running as a slate, is because it's high time that we give voice to the resounding message of liberty. We should stop sugarcoating it. We should stop watering it down. We should stop trying to dress it up to look like the distinct, to look like the duopoly. We don't need to look like Democrats or Republicans because they're the problem. We need to be exactly what we are, no holds barred. We are libertarians. We do not want government. We do not need government. We believe in personal responsibility and self-ownership. We believe in the rights to life, liberty, and justly acquired property. We believe in self-defense. These are things that we care about, and we will fight for it. So I'm running as a slate because it's about the message, not about the messenger, though we are the ones that are in front of the microphone, all four of us here and beyond. It is the message, and it needs to be heard. And there are 46% of people in 2016 who didn't even vote because they were so disgusted, so disenfranchised, so disaffected by the system that they couldn't even bring the will to get up and go to the polls. Those are the people we need to talk to. Those are the votes we need to capture. It's time we take back our power. Miss Kim Ruff, thank you. We'll move on to Benjamin Letter. <clears throat> um, well, I thought it was a pretty good debate. Uh, maybe a could have said some more about some different things, but uh, what I'd rather say right now is uh, if you're a felon and you live in the United States, register to vote. Uh, if you live in a state where you can't register to vote, try to move to a state where you can. If you can run for local office, run for local office, city council, county commissioner, sheriff, whatever run, try, get involved, figure out who your city council uh, members are and, and who your county commissioner is. And don't be so distracted by the mainstream media uh, and the presidential race when you might not even know who your city council members are and who your county commissioner uh, is. This is where we need to be focusing um, and pressuring the the, le the legislation on those local levels, because we could, we could improve things so much just right there in our own backyards. Um, our libertarian candidates for state house, state senate, state con or, you know, US Congress and US Senate, uh, we need you guys to start coming up with some, legislati some legislation. We need a legislative agenda we need bills that we can say that we support and that we would sign uh, if we were elected. We need our own version of the Green New Deal, call it a gold deal, a golden deal, whatever you want. But we need our own legislation 
ready to go and we need it right now and we need to be campaigning on it in 2020 and to help really bring our identity together with legislation that we can say this is legislation that we support. Uh, with that being said, uh, my name is Ben Letter. I'm running for president. Uh, you can visit my website, uh, benletter.com. Ben Letter, everybody, thank you very much. Uh, we'll go next to Mr. Arvind Vora. I'm running for president to abolish the welfare state and to end the income tax. I want to get rid of regulations on individuals, get rid of regulations on businesses. I want to make America free and prosperous and great. But I want to take these, this time specifically to speak to a lot of the underdogs, to a lot of the people that this current power structure has left behind, and that the second you try to rise up, it smacks you right back down and hands the power that should be yours to the people who already have in power, uh, who already have power. So many of you are currently in prison. You're unable to vote, you're unable to do anything because you happen to be a minority who used marijuana or sold marijuana. And while you rot away in prison, you have people who are <coughs> from a more established class or more established group that are raking in money by selling marijuana. This idea that the people who are at the bottom have to stay at the bottom and the people who have to stay or who are at the top stay at the top, I don't hold to that for one second. I'm not bringing freedom just for the rich. I'm bringing freedom so that you can become the rich. To the small business owners out there, I'm a small business owner too. And I know that one of the hardest things for a small business owner to, to do is to find the right dedicated, hardworking people. You know, Chris is right. When somebody works for you, they're doing you a favor. And I'm going to bring home a million hardworking men and women. I'm talking about the US military troops that are currently being wasted on stupid desert war. Those are your new employees. Those are people who are gonna make your businesses stronger, make you more successful, make you proud to be an American and proud to be an American small business owner. I'm talking to the people who are sex workers right now, who after all the struggles you go through, then have one website after another be ordered by the government to, be shut, to shut you down and tell you that the way you make a living is morally wrong and should be illegal. I'm gonna end that. Sex work is work, government work is theft, but interfering with somebody else's natural right to make a living is absolutely wrong, and I'm going to put a stop to it. Those of you who are in jail right now for something that shouldn't be a crime, I'm going to let you out. I'm going to pardon you, and I'm going to let you out. Those of you who have family members, parents, fathers, mothers who are there in prison right now, I'm going to let them out because they don't belong there. They belong home with you. They did not do anything wrong, and they certainly didn't do anything that deserved being locked up into a government cage. Libertarianism is not just about helping the entrenched classes. It's about letting everyone compete fairly. As a small business owner who has an educational startup, I believe in fair competition. Teachers, I believe that you can do better in the free market. That's why I want to end government school. This is not about punishing you. It's about giving you something better. If you want to learn more about my campaign, please go to votevora.com. My last name is spelled V as in Victor, O-H-R-A, votevora.com. All right, three minutes. We'll end with Mr. Christopher Marks. Hi, I'm Christopher Marks. I'm running for the Libertarian a, nomination to be pre, President of the United States. What I need people to understand is that I'm the man that will bring both, a, bring from the Democrats as well as bring from the Republicans by telling you the truth. The Republicans work for corporate privilege and interest. The Democrats work for state privilege and interest. And you, the people, are taxed and there is no representation. The Libertarian Party is your new home. We are the party that will represent the people's rights and interests above state and corporate privilege and interest. We will take and we will restore the freedoms. We will hold your rights and your interests above all else. Through my, through my campaign, I plan on going through and repealing many federal deep state operations and agencies. This will nationally cut our overall debt by such immense numbers, it will, it will baffle you how quickly America is able to get back on its feet. I have a plan to actually create an honest revenue stream for our government, in which this government will now be incentivized to look towards creating honest, renewable 
energy resources. And they will use these money, if the monies that they gain from selling these, uh, selling this electricity to the corporations at a cheaper rate to bring high paying jobs into the, their local jurisdiction, give you better paying jobs, as well as paying for their own jobs so that they spend less time messing around in your individual lives. We have a government that has no distraction. Let me help them be distracted by creating renewable resource energy. This will overall make it to where there is an, a, we end the relationship with the Federal Reserve. We bring ourselves out of debt and we will actually print Article 1, Section 8 constitutionally printed monies that will actually be based off of something that we can be domestically solvent in producing. This will overall end the, uh, the international wars that we have seeking control over petroleum exchanges. And I'm Christopher Marks, 2020. Uh, you can find me for on Christopher on Facebook, Christopher Marks for President, 2020. Awesome candidates, thank you so much for your time. I did not ask easy questions, and you all did an admirable job answering them. I know this is two hours out of your time, and you've committed to be here. You are obviously all invited, and I hope you will attend our debates every other week. Uh, listeners, as well as candidates, thank you for tuning in. I appreciate you being here. If you enjoyed what you heard and would like to hear more debate, please like this, please share this, please support We Are Libertarians on Patreon. It means the world to us. Thank you again, and keep fueling the fires of liberty. <laughs>